All right, so um, I think we're ready to begin. Welcome everyone uh, to today's webinar. My name is Marisa Fraser Morera, and I will be uh, today's moderator for this event. So uh, our webinar today is entitled Demonstrating the Excipient Effect in Vitro for Subcutaneous Preclin Preclinical Formulation Analysis and will be presented by Conor Gomes, um, our development scientist at PIOM. Dr. Gomes earned his bachelor's in chemistry from Emmanuel College before earning a doctorate in chemistry at Northeastern University, specializing in the synthesis and characterization of biomaterials. Since coming to PION, Dr. Gomes has led the development of the artificial extracellular matrices found at the heart of PION scissor instrument. Also joining us today to assist with our Q&A is Imogen Anastasiu, uh, our product manager for subcutaneous injection site simulator, simulator scissor M3, and uh, Balin Sinko, our VP of Innovation and Development. Uh, welcome both. Um, we want this webinar to be interactive and encourage you to contribute to its success by asking questions at any time during the presentation through our Q&A widget. And uh, because of a conflict with Connor's schedule, we had to record uh, the session today. But we do have, as I mentioned, Amy and Bolint uh, in this live session to assist with any questions you may have. Again, just send those through the Q&A widget and we'll get to them at the end of the presentation. If we don't get to cover all of the questions today, we will make sure we answer them via email. So uh, just make sure that you don't submit your question as anonymous because then we cannot answer your question. If you do want an answer and we're running out of time, just again, make sure uh, you don't click on anonymous so we can reach out to you. Um, if you need any technical assistance during the presentation, uh, send me a chat message. Again, it's through that chat widget. Um, I'll make sure um, I get to them and assist you as best as I can. And uh, now, uh, without further ado, let's get started with our presentation. Thank you. Let's mute ourselves and we'll uh, disconnect our video for now and we'll come back at the end of the presentation. Hello, I am Dr. Connor Gomes. I am an R&D scientist for Pion Inc. in the United States offices. Uh, I will be presenting this webinar to you today. It was my full intention to have this be done as a live webinar, uh, but I had a family matter coming up, so I will be giving you this pre-recorded webinar instead. I apologize about that. However, if you have any uh, technical or other related questions about anything you see today, you can see my email up on the screen here. Uh, please email me with any questions. Uh, no question is too small or large. Um, as well as uh, Imi, our product manager for the analytical platform that we'll be reviewing today inside this webinar. Uh, her email is also up here. Uh, feel free to email her or I uh, with any questions or comments you have. Uh, but without further ado, uh, I will be discussing the demonstration of the excipient effect uh, during in vitro subcutaneous preclinical formulation analysis within our scissor platform. I'm just going to remove my camera so that we can see the, the full slides going forward. We will start the presentation by very briefly going through just the drug development pipeline and where the methods and types of decisions that we're going to be talking about today fit into that pipeline. Specifically, that will be during the preclinical analysis. Uh, so we're going to review some preclinical analytics and what uh, scientists are normally probing in order to make these types of decisions, uh, as well as finish off that with uh, specifically talking about what excipient screening is. In order to discuss the case studies that fall under the umbrella of this excipient screening uh, during in vitro testing, we'll have to review the analytical method that was used for the bulk of these studies, if not every single part of this study. Um, that would be our own scissor platform, the subcutaneous injection site simulator, which I will go over in a few slides. Uh, it will also review uh, the spectroscopic method that was actually used to detect the formulations that we're going to be speaking about today. 
Uh, lastly, we will go through how each of these, uh, all, all of the excipients were screened within that platform, uh, how we made decisions about uh, what to do within these case studies, um, how each of the release uh, kinetics and release behaviors of each of these formulations was affected by those excipients. And then we'll finish by briefly discussing just the future implications that these studies have, as well as um, how to expand on them uh, to make a more uh, robust, not only study, but uh, just operating procedure for probing these excipients moving forward. As I'm fairly confident, most of us on this presentation today are fairly familiar with what the drug development pipeline looks like. Uh, just to quickly touch on it um, and where our instruments and discussions today will be uh, fitting in. Uh, at first, uh, you have this drug discovery steps where, uh, you know, you have your identification of the core active pharmaceutical ingredient that will be included within your uh, formulation to be injected subcutaneously or otherwise in other general cases. Um, after you have an idea of the active pharmaceutical ingredient, you will add in all of the excipients or ingredients that we'll be talking about today uh, to actually create a formulation using that pharmaceutical ingredient um, and how to make that behave how for a formulation scientist would want after it is introduced into a human body, uh, as well as how to uh, probe the question of how these formulations will act in a human body before they actually get there. Once all of these formulations are tested in a preclinical setting before they touch any uh, living biology, they go into the clinic where they will uh, be introduced into human subjects or animal subjects depending on the type of medicine um, this human testing comes after uh, the toxicology screenings and the pharmacokinetic screenings that came in the preclinical and drug discovery stages um, and after the results of this clinical research are uh, amalgamated uh, the formulation and the api itself are submitted for overall drug approval uh, so that they can be distributed and used in a general medical setting But as I mentioned, the bulk of this, uh, of the narrative of this presentation will take place in this preclinical research stage, specifically the in vitro testing uh, within an acellular environment. Uh, that platform, the scissor platform can be seen at the bottom of this slide. Uh, the development of this instrument out of the University of Bath uh, by Dr. Randall Mersney, um, originally validated the instrument uh, with a set of monoclonal antibodies that were shown to have a better clinical correlation as compared to uh, the in vivo animal testing that was done on those formulations. Uh, just showing the uh, point that as these formulations get more biologic in nature, the metabolic catabolic uh, pathways that are present in human beings um, and the extracellular matrix components that are found there uh, are going to be very influential on the fate of these, uh, especially biologic subcutaneously uh, injectable formulations. And so looking at this scissor instrument and its uh, internals, we can see that there are three chambers set up within the shell of the instrument. Uh, these three chambers will run three different experiments, hence the name scissor M3. Um, and again, each of these chambers is set up to simulate the subcutaneous environment. Um, and how we achieve that, I'll, I'll explain in a bit, using all of these different sensors, cameras, and probes. We're just going to look at one chamber because, again, all three of them are doing the exact same thing. Uh, and so just looking in and zooming in on one chamber really quickly. Uh, you can see a schematic of it here. Um, So the very first thing uh, we will focus on uh, is the cartridge at the heart of the instrument. So we're gonna uh, work from the center out uh, to explain this instrument. So inside the middle of this chamber, there will be a cartridge housing an artificial extracellular matrix. This cartridge uh, will be filled with an, uh, a, a clear fluid uh, and the sides of this cartridge uh, our 
uh, are clear uh, to allow uh, passage of um, two LED turbidity sensors to pass through the cartridge to monitor the site um, at all times. Uh, and the front of the cartridge is covered by a porous membrane. Uh, this porous membrane it allows pass and diffusion of the components within the cartridge and outside of the cartridge. Uh, that way, the injectate that's introduced to this space uh, can then flow uh, from out. To inject into this cartridge, uh, we have a injection port that houses either our own auto injector or a one mil pre-filled syringe. After injection into the cartridge, a bolus will form and that bolus will leave out of those porous membrane windows that I mentioned previously. Uh, after that injectate leaves through this window, it will then reside in this outer chamber. So this outer chamber is filled with a simulated interstitial fluid uh, or carbonate buffer. Uh, this carbonate buffer will be monitored by a pH probe that's uh, in place throughout the duration of the experiment. This chamber electrode uh, will connect to an external CO2 supply that will uh, be introduced to the top of the solution when the pH of the solution reaches too high uh, to be corrected back down. There is also a cartridge electrode that is monitoring the pH at the injection site within that simulated uh, subcutaneous space. This artificial external matrix uh, will then read a pH uh, that is closer to that of the injectate upon injection. And then uh, pass the diffusion of that bolus will then allow the pH to then re-equilibrate to the surrounding 7.4 that's found in the carbonate buffer. To control the environment uh, in a physiologically relevant manner, uh, we have placed a thermocouple and a heating plate around the chamber so that the chamber can be held at typically a temperature of 34 degrees Celsius, um, although that control is obviously variable uh, throughout the duration of these studies that are coming up. Uh, this environment was held at 34 degrees Celsius. To ensure a homogeneous environment, there is a stir bar placed uh, at 200 RPM at the bottom of the chamber. Um, this stir bar uh, will be responsible for homogenizing the chamber, but there will also be uh, a, there's also a pump available that can pump the solution found in this chamber uh, to an external uh, sampling vial. Uh, this sample can be manually sampled from using just a one mil syringe on it oneself or there is an offline fiber optic sampling robot that can sample from that flow through vial uh, at specific time points during the experiment. Now, uh, we also have the ability using our own in situ fiber optic probes, specifically our rainbow platform. We can take in situ UV vis measurements of the uh, surrounding chamber buffer. And so, we can monitor as our API of interest or excipient of interest with a UV signature leaves this chamber, we are able to detect it almost immediately using these uh, in-situ fiber optic absorbance probes. And then, uh, as mentioned previously, the artificial ECM uh, that simulates the subcutaneous environment that's housed inside the cartridge, uh, we like to keep that uh, as optically clear as we possibly can, even with additives, because we have LEDs uh, that pass through this cartridge to monitor turbidity. Uh, this is a great way to probe post-injection aggregation events uh, after the introduction of an injectate into a simulated subcutaneous environment. So uh, those LEDs pass from uh, their light to a detector on the other side of the cartridge through those clear windows as an injection comes from above through that injection port. Uh, these LEDs will be interrupted so that the bolus uh, will would increase the turbidity of this uh, space. Uh, and therefore, this LED would then read uh, tur turbid at, as this bolus passes from the syringe needle to uh, the top of the cartridge. In addition to turbidity sensors monitoring the 
behavior that's found within the subcutaneous environment, the simulated subcutaneous environment. There are external cameras that will take images of uh, the entire space that the reaction is going on within um, these images. You can see this is pre-injection where we have our optically clear simulated subcutaneous environment and artificial exterior matrix. Uh, then at some point we inject a um, solution of interest within to that environment. Uh, and then an experiment will run as that solution diffuses and interacts with the simulated subcutaneous environment and the surrounding carbonate buffer with its ions and cations. And now to put all of that together, um, we have a uh, simulated subcutaneous environment um, that we are looking to develop in order to uh, either improve upon or bypass the uh, preclinical in vivo methods we have at our disposal today, uh, again, by improving the in vitro methods we have at our disposal. And so um, with the probes and sensors uh, and various control that we have with inside the uh, simulator itself, we can get a very good picture of what's happening uh, after an injection is introduced into the space where uh, not only can we track the release of this uh, injectate out of these dialysis membranes, but the pH of that environment uh, within that simulated subcutaneous environment can be tracked as well. Uh, and the transmission uh, that, these L that the LEDs passing through the cartridge can exhibit can also be tracked over time as well to get a holistic picture or attempt to get a holistic picture of the post-injection events that will dictate the pharmacokinetic behavior and pharmacodynamic behavior uh, of the pharmaceutical injectables. And with us now reviewing the drug development pipeline, uh, centering in on the preclinical formulation testing and the place that the scissor platform has within that uh, area we can now look at uh, our first case study, which includes the procurement of a commercially available formulation of uh, denosumab, uh, varying the excipient levels of that formulation, and then testing the release dynamics within the scissor platform. The commercially available formulation was procured from a local pharmacy, um, and then the formulation was placed in different environments to remove each excipient to then uh, control and probe how each one individually affects the release profile that's seen within the simulated subcutaneous environment within scissor. So uh, this injectable is uh, after administration is detectable in the blood up to 100 days after. Uh, so we have something that would act like a long-acting injectable where you would have presence or some sort of action that would cause a, a delayed response over, over a long, long period of time. Uh, this formulation in particular will have our denosumab or monoclonal antibody at 60 mg per mil, a surfactant, polysorbate 20, at 0.1 mg per mil, a cryoprotectant agent and uh, stabilizer, sorbitol, at 47 mg per mil, and uh, this is all suspended in an acetate buffer um, at slightly acidic pH. And to explain each of those excipients and how we actually remove them, um, here we have our API denosumab, which is that monoclonal antibody at 60 mg per mil. Uh, that is in a acetate buffer, which has solubilized polysorbate 20 or tween 20. Uh, this helps with the solubilization of the monoclonal antibody denosumab, as well as helps with solubilization and shelf life stability over time so that monoclonal antibody doesn't crash out of solution um, and it stays above that solubility. The last excipient is a sorbitol. This is a uh, stabilizer. Uh, it's a, uh, a thickener for the viscoelastic properties of many solutions, uh, a humectant, an a uh, anticryogenic or cryoprotectant agent. Uh, so that these formulations can be shipped cold without fear of freezing. Um, this sorbitol molecule with so many actions, uh, we definitely want to probe what, how it actually affects the release profile of this drug. Um, and yeah, so to remove each of these systematically or individually, 
the complete commercial formulation was placed in a dialysis cassette with a 10 kilodalton cutoff. Um, and then any excipient of interest, <clears throat> we wanted to be left with our denosumab thereafter, uh, we would include in our 600 times dilution um, dialysis uh, bath. Uh, and this was stirred for uh, various times, uh, depending on the study, which we'll go into in a little bit. So uh, step one was uh, the, the dialysis treatment of the formulation. And so as we can see in this table, we have a couple different labeled uh, excipients uh, or samples, excuse me. Um, for the very first experiment we looked at, uh, we wanted to know how long to incubate our formulation within our uh, dialysis bath, uh, not in order to complete it, completely exchange those excipients, but also how dialysis would affect the results we were seeing thereafter. So um, just to make sure that our the process in which we were varying our uh, formulation was not therefore impacting the release profile. Uh, and then, so yeah, so step two, um, after all samples were prepared, we had uh, to run those control experiments where the injections of the pristine or untreated uh, formulation and the dialyzed formulations were compared. So then moving forward, we have, uh, again, just that summarized table of our first few samples in the lower left-hand corner. Uh, but what was placed into our simulated subcutaneous space was a 200 microliter injection of that denosumab formulation. Uh, and that pristine sample, one that did not go through dialysis, which is seen by this blue profile here, uh, released over 40 to 60 hours um, and had uh, a pretty quick release in the first 10 to 20 hours and then uh, a steady release to 100% thereafter. Uh, as you can see, the standard deviation is pretty tight, so we were really happy with this run. Um, the next sample uh, we're going to look at is the 18-hour sample. So the 18-hour sample does change its release profile uh, pretty uh, significantly during during some points um, as compared to the pristine sample. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, however, it does seem to have at least similar kinetics or a, a rise to the 100% maximum uh, within that you know 40-hour time range uh, time span. Uh, thereafter, we had a three-day uh, dialysis treatment uh, where this dialysis treatment, I'm, I apologize, uh, both of these dialysis treatments uh, kept all of the excipients in every sample uh, so that the only difference was just the, the incubation time. So that three-day sample that I was about to mention, um, we can see a drastic deviation from the release profile that was exhibited from the pristine and the 18-hour incubated sample. So just moving forward, uh, when we go through and systematically change our formulation, uh, it looks like our 18-hour incubation time uh, will be sufficient. And when that, with that 10 kilodalton cutoff, uh, we are definitely not worried about any of these excipients being left over after that 600 times dilution for that 18 hours. So from our first little experiments, we now know and have a core setup of our... Uh, dialysis methodology. So we look to change our very first excipient or at least property of the commercially available formulation. Um, the one that was easiest to uh, come forth to us first was the actual buffer that the entire formulation is suspended in. So we exchange that native acetate buffer for a phosphate buffer at a higher pH. Um, and then we look for any deviations or changes from the pharmacodynamic or pharmacokinetic behavior that was observed within the scissor or release profiles that were found within the scissor. So uh, we can see here the samples that will be on the next screen. So we have uh, the samples that were previously shown where we have an 18 hour and three day incubation of all of the excipients uh, within an acetate buffer system. And then we are going to add to that graph a uh, phosphate buffer solution exchanged uh, for that acetate buffer uh, to see how these different pHs affect the performance of the monoclonal antibody. The native formulation, um, again, is shown in blue, and that is uh, at a pH of 5.2 in an acetate buffer. Um, we can see the 18-hour uh, sample just to remind us that uh, what an 18-hour acetate sample looks like. Uh, 
18 hour dialyzed acetate sample looks like. Um, and then we have two three day samples down below. Uh, you'll notice on the previous slide and this table that uh, we're only going to show three days of the phosphate buffer exchanged system. Um, that's because uh, due to material constraints, we were, all, we were only able to test this, this one three day sample. And so, or these three three day samples, excuse me. Uh, and so we have uh, pretty similar initial kinetics between the phosphate buffer system and the acetate formulation. Uh, however, there's deviation between 20 and 40 hours as we approach what seems to be the last kinetic step as we approach that 100% release profile. Um, this intermediate step, uh, it's, we do not have any hypotheses about what causes this deviation other than uh, primarily if you are in different pHs, um, there will be different aggregation condensation events that happen within solution. And based on the concentration of solute, um, you can get the aggregation and therefore, and then release of that aggregation after a minimal concentration is, is reached in the bulk solution. So that's possibly what's going on, but without further probing of these mechanisms, um, uh, we can't tell that for certain. And so, um, yeah, those are the, those are the main takeaways from this graph. Uh, the one thing that the one piece of data that's not shown uh, because we didn't collect a holistic data set of it, but um, the phosphate buffer solution, when these experiments were left for long, long periods of time, um, the data exhibited uh, scattering effects or um, yeah, spectroscopic events that were uh, indicative of some sort of aggregation or uh, aggregates at least crashing out of solution. Uh, whether they're MAB or an excipient, uh, there's, we have not probed that question yet, but um, uh, moving forward, we looked to keep the system as close to the, at least the buffering system as close to the native formulation as possible. That paired with the couple observations we had over those long periods of time, we thought it was good to go forward with the acetate buffer to probe the uh, excipients that we have left in this study. Now that we have determined the methodology we need to remove each excipient via dialysis, as well as the buffering agents and pH that our formulations will be at to probe the remaining excipients, uh, we look to remove the uh, sorbitol and polysorbate from the formulation now. Uh, and so each of uh, the samples were incubated in a respective uh, buffer, either the pristine acetate buffer to leave no excipients left for the denosumab or an acetate buffer with only polysorbate 20 to remove just the sorbitol from the denosumab formulation. Uh, yeah, those were all, those were each incubated for 18 hours um, and then injected into the scissor for similar analysis. Looking at this graph, we can see in the dark blue again, the pristine formulation of denosumab, so the unadulterated, non-dialyzed formulation. Um, and uh, we have the overlapping 18-hour dialysis run. Um, and then, so moving down from that, uh, the first run I want to point out is just the N of 1. So this is going to be denosumab all by itself within a uh, acetate buffer. And we can see that the, ha the release profile is slow and incomplete. Um, this would be just a monoclonal antibody that may or may not crash out or diffuse as readily or be as soluble in a system without the addition of all of its excipients. Um, and so then we can look at actually what the addition of only polysorbate would do to the formulation. So uh, what we're seeing here, uh, this large standard deviation and this large, uh, this large kick up, uh, this large initial jump in the release percentages are indicative of what we term early release, uh, typically caused by reflux up the needle pathway when injecting into the either a real or simulated subcutaneous space. And so polysorbate 20 being a surfactant would decrease the viscosity and, and interrupt the surface tension of the injectate. Um, and sorbitol, at such a high concentration of 47 mg per mil uh, and its role as a uh, humectant and thickening agent um, could counteract some of the mechanics that are present because of that surfactant. And so with the addition of sorbitol, 
into the formulation, which would be the representative 18-hour uh, dialysis run, we can see that the early release kinetics of just a polysorbate uh, only excipient uh, are negated by the inclusion of the sorbitol. And so uh, not only is the sorbitol acting independently as that uh, cryoprotectant agent, but again, it's sort of counteracting some of the cons that can be seen uh, when we use surfactants in order to uh, solubilize monoclonal antibodies for injection into an aqueous environment. And as our first study uh, showed the variations that we did to a commercially available formulation and uh, the drastic impact that actually systematically removing each excipient can have on the release of that MAB, we now go to a case study where uh, Pion procured a, or has a, uh, an unknown MAB to us, but it is a monoclonal antibody. Um, and it is suspended in what we believe to be a buffered solution. Uh, and we looked to add in excipients to the solution to then see how adding in these excipients can impact a, 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 a general monoclonal antibody, or at least a blinded monoclonal antibody. So just the study really quick was just a general look at how adding different excipients to a MAB-based formulation can impact the release profiles and release kinetics seen within scissor and then possibly in a native subcutaneous environment. Um, this MAB stock has an initial pH of 5.8 at 147 mg per mil, and we were looking to add polysorbate 20, uh, a variation on polysorbate 20, polysorbate 80. Uh, these two will exhibit different uh, lipophilicities or hydrophilicities um, and are slightly different molecular weights. Uh, and then we're also adding in uh, sorbitol because, again, we're we're looking to probe the, the role of sorbitol itself, um, as well as possibly the impact it has on the inclusion of surfactants within these systems. Um, now for the, uh, just the inclusion of sorbitol. Uh, and so we wanted to see how, without knowing uh, the solubility of this monoclonal antibody, um, and if surfactants are even needed in the first place to increase or keep that solubility within a simulated subcutaneous environment or more biologically a relevant environment like a carbonate buffer. Um, we added sorbitol uh, at, a, again, the same higher concentration as was exhibited in our commercially available denosumab formulation. Um, and we saw that adding in, uh, even though that uh, unconfirmed but would increase the viscosity of this solution, um, we see very similar release profiles out of the simulated subcutaneous environment. Um, so this just means that it sort of further validates, as <laughs> all formulation chemists will know, that sorbitol is a great cryoprotectant. Um, it, it does its job at, at lowering that freezing point as well as not affecting the overall release kinetics of a biologic agent. Um, and so this was a great confirmation of that, uh, although simple, a good confirmation of the behavior in scissor as well. Going forward, we look to include polysorbate 20, or that uh, surfactant that was seen, uh, that was most likely used to help solubilize the denosumab in the commercial formulation. Uh, and so on the left, we will see the three individual runs uh, of the three injections that we could do uh, in parallel within the Scissor N3 platform. Uh, and on the right, we see the overlaid um, polysorbate 20 run, as well as the uh, just unadulterated stock MAB X solution. Um, looking at the average, we just see a, a faster release right off the bat. Um, and what looks like a similar plateau to a value there later on. Um, we want to probe as why that average was greater. And it, when we look at the three individual runs, although the bottom two green runs look to be uh, similar to that of the native MAD run and therefore the sorbitol run, um, there's this early release profile that we've seen inside Scissor. Now, we can't know what causes this uh, early release as it can be a, um, a torn part of the dialysis membrane. It can absolutely be reflux up the needle pathway. Um, it, it, it can be a failure mechanically of, of the cartridge uh, on v extremely rare occasions. Um, so we can't really say what this is for sure. However, we do know 
that the same behavior of polysorbate 20 was seen within the denosumab formulation. And so it, it tends to say that the when one does include the polysorbate 20 the tween 20 uh, in a formulation, it will interrupt at least surface tension, it seems, enough to warrant early release in some fashion, whether that be needle uh, reflux up the needle pathway or not. Um, and so although it caused faster release, it looks like it was mainly caused by uh, a phenomenon that would cause a uh, an atypical or a um, unintended release profile even within or possibly within an in vivo environment. For our final sample, uh, we looked to compare the performance of a polysorbate 80 excipient to that of the polysorbate 20 excipient at the same concentration of 0.1 mg per mil. Um, as a reminder, we can see the unadulterated MAB4 solution in blue, the early release uh, polysorbate 20 formulation in green, and then our currently running right now is the polysorbate 80 uh, sample right now, which is why it hasn't finished quite yet. Um, and what we see is a, uh, a nice similar release profile as compared to that uh, original stock solution and therefore also the sorbitol containing solution. Um, as polysorbate 80, again, will have a more uh, hydrophobic nature as compared to the polysorbate 20. There could be differences in how the monoclonal antibody interacts with such an excipient. Um, and this excipient will therefore have different interactions with the simulated subcutaneous environment and the simulated interstitial fluid that's present within the scissor system. Um, and so although within the scope of this case study, we haven't gotten to looking into the post-injection phenomena and the differences between the two, between these two samples. However, um, this is sort of like data we would see if one was trying to probe, you know, on what excipient to include in a formulation. And although in order to make a conclusion on that scale, we would need to repeat this study to a more grandiose manner uh, with more variations in concentration, of course. Uh, but as far as these two concentrations, if I was trying to make the decision uh, to include polysorbate 80 or polysorbate 20 to aid in the performance or at least solubility or stability of my MAB solution, uh, I would probably look to include polysorbate 80 as with a 33% chance of early release within an N of three, uh, the polysorbate 80 didn't uh, exhibit any of the same early release factors that the polysorbate 20 did. And so uh, again, I'm not trying to say that this is, this is impactful enough data to make that claim on a grandiose manufacturing scale. However, this is the type of data that we look for uh, on the small scale to try and make those different types of decisions. Uh, and now, just to just to wrap up, so um, the scissor platform that we reviewed uh, and its spot in the preclinical formulation analysis stages, um, it seems to it can absolutely differentiate between excipient behavior. Um, we showed a different examples uh, with a couple different case studies. Um, these conclusions also included that uh, when you do include certain surfactants that will decrease the surface tension and viscosity of your overall solution some thickeners are needed to replace uh, those viscoelastic properties to make sure that, or to minimize uh, the risk of either early injection inside of an in vitro methodology like the scissor or um, in vivo with reflux up the needle pathway, uh, therefore affecting the amount delivered to the site. Um, and lastly, uh, this wasn't a strong conclusion, but we had uh, hints that polysorbate 20 and polysorbate 80 may differ in their performance uh, within a formulation as far as uh, early release uh, phenomena that are uh, caused by the inclusion of those excipients. Um, however, like I said before, uh, or a more robust study would be needed to make that conclusion holistically. Uh, but I think that we definitely showed where the first steps would, would be on, on that pathway. Um, the immediate outlooks past this, past these case studies, um, of course, are looking deeper into how to differentiate the decision between something like surfactant. So, you know, uh, really looking back at those post-injection phenomenon, um, solution stability, uh, post-injection aggregation over longer periods within the scissor platform are a couple examples are, that we can probe with that. 
Um, there's many excipient combinations within the study that we left out. So uh, to exhaust all the combinations uh, of each excipient that were studied would be would be many samples that were just uh, not inside the scope of the time span that this was carried out, uh, but are definitely you know on our on our experimental planning for the future. Um, and then again, the last little bit of information that's needed for this is actually a characterization. Um, of the assay parameters and the assay observations that show up when you do have specific interaction of excipients uh, with biomolecules or ECM components found in that simulated subcutaneous space. And then all of those, uh, those conclusions and outlooks uh, all lead us to our long-term goals uh, through this kind of work of developing uh, an analytical methodology uh, to probe injection failure or reflux up the needle if there is going to be a failure within that pla uh, within that um, delivery method. Uh, we uh, to improve on our post injection analysis to show that uh, when aggregation and condensation do occur, uh, there are release profile differences within that, as well as different um, observable uh, phenomena you can see within the scissor platform. Uh, and then lastly, uh, there are going to be certain biomolecule specific behaviors uh, of the excipient. So there's excipients that are going to interact with the surrounding environment that's found within the subcutaneous space. Um, and uh, basically the addition of different case studies will probe how each of these excipients uh, interacts in that subcutaneous environment. So yeah, th th thank you very much for your attention. Um, Again, this was a this was a pre-recorded webinar on, on, on my part, so I'm, I, I apologize about that, that I won't be there for your for your questions and answers. Uh, but again, my uh, my contact information can be found at the top of the screen uh, as Connor Gomes, the R&D scientist uh, and uh, Emmy, who's uh, I, I know is there, the product manager uh, for the scissor platform. Uh, her emails up here and she's available for questions. Um, so again, thank you. Uh, please don't be shy to email me. Any question you have, uh, even if it's not asked at, at, at the end of that webinar, um, and if, if any do come in, I, I will try to get out answers as fast as I possibly can. So uh, thank you again, um, and hope to see you at the next webinar. Have a good day. Okay. That brings us to the end of uh, the recorded presentation. Uh, we did get some questions um, in our Q&A uh, widget, so we're going to cover as many as we can today. Again, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to send them uh, via the Q&A. And uh, we'll begin with our first question here. Uh, external CO2 connection will impact the hydrodynamic nature of the system. So how does this system overcome this? Belen, do you want to take this one or? If, yes, so in the in the scissor and uh, and free system, we are uh, blanketing the CO2 on the surface of the liquid. So it's actually the, there is not much uh, interaction. There is not much hydrodynamic impact of the way we are uh, setting the pH with the CO2, uh, the hydrodynamic impact is that's coming from the stirring itself and uh, and uh, potentially the pumping that is uh, may or may not be turned on during the assay. So that's a that was a change since the scissor and one system, which uh, used a, a needle to to actually pump the CO2 directly into the liquid. That's not the case anymore for the N3 version. Okay, thank you, Valint. Um, next question. I am not sure if I missed it, but does the subcutaneous environment mimic conditions such as pH, osmo, et cetera, of injection site? And yeah, I maybe I can. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, maybe I will just take that. So, of course, the uh, original developers of the system, uh, Randy Mersney and, uh, and his team, they were trying to mimic each and every aspect of the uh, of the of the CQ environment as much as as possible in a relatively simple in vitro model. So uh, temperature is uh, of course is covered the pH uh, and the buffer composition as well, uh, especially in terms of uh, inorganic components. 
uh, the osmolarity is, is uh, probably not uh, exactly the same due to the differences in the, in the bio components mostly, although the, the main or the most important components uh, are already in, in the um, ECM version or versions and uh, we are working on further ECMs to, to improve that aspect of the system uh, even more. Uh, Pressure-wise, that was something else that was tested back then uh, uh, to mimic that, and uh, that aspect is is probably not really or not truly really mimicked in the in the current system. Okay, thank you. Um, next question: How is the release of the drug monitored or measured? So, the in this study, um, we were just using the rainbow. So we were using the pion rainbow, which is an in situ UV fiber optic dip probe. Um, and we were measuring the UV in real time as the API, um, whether it was MAVX or the denosumab, diffused out into the outer chamber. And then we would um, take those concentration values and um, match them against the calibration curve, which we would have done prior to the assay with the rainbow system in order to quantify concentration or percent release. Um, we normally can take samples as well for offline analytics with HPLC and things, um, but just in this study, we, we're using the rainbow. Maybe if I can, if yeah. I can add today just one, one small thing. So uh, due to the na nature of the fiber optic probe, uh, looking at baseline elevation or even uh, the zinc point shift in the in the second derivative spectrum, those can give some information on the aggregation or maybe some some uh, structural changes to the protein, maybe some unfolding and uh, denaturation as well. Those are not not very explicit. Those are more like a like a qualitative analysis if that something may be happening as the zinc points are shifting, but still can be a good indication that something is going on as the assay is progressing. That's that's a good point actually as well because um, I think in Connor's presentation he mentioned during the um, phosphate buffer runs there was that sort of zim shift which he was observing which he said could be uh, related to aggregation dense or something like that. Okay, our next question. Um... How do results from HPLC method correlate with the rainbow readings or the collection of samples or how the collection of samples is affected by the dilution effect? Do we apply a factor to the rainbow results in order to correlate with HPLC methods? So it's, uh, I mean, in general, the rainbow and HPLC um, data correlates very well. Is this maybe relating to if we remove aliquots and also do rainbow analysis? Um, you would have to factor that slight dilution into your, your assay results. Um, but generally, if you're taking such a small amount in a 300 mil vessel, um, it probably will be very small on the percentage scale, but maybe the lint will have a bit more on that. No, I, I yeah, I think that's uh, that's fair. I mean, the one thing I can think of is that during a a longer uh, period of time or longer assays, uh, evaporation can can happen, and that can that can sometimes impact the results. From the so that's why in some cases you see uh, over one hundred percent release. It it can be a reason for that 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 it's hard to it's hard to compensate uh, for that uh, for that effect in the system. At okay. least hard at the moment. Uh, why was 200 microliter injection volume for denosum? Denosum ab. Yeah. yeah. Then, sorry. No, no. Um, so we we chose a 200 microliter um denosum ab formulation. Um, sorry, injection volume mainly because of our constraint with. The amount of sample that we had as well um, and we also were using denosumab in a previous study where we were comparing the ECM with our ECM XR um, which we were using lower injection volumes to, to cross comparison, full cross comparison so. 
Um, is there any formulation difference of uh, the NOSMAP of 18 hours and three day release curves? So I think this is a based on the dialysis uh, run. So essentially the, the dialysis itself did have an impact on the, the um, formulation, but the actual formulation there is the same. So it is the commercial formulation just either dialyzed for 18 hours or three days. So there are no differences in um, the original composition of the formulation. It's just been dialyzed or not dialyzed. Okay. Um, can the scissor be used to monitor a suspension, inject a suspension and monitor the dissolution and release of the particles? Yeah, so we, sorry, were you about to say something, Berlin? No. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so we do uh, work with suspensions. We have people working with suspensions in completely different um, drug candidate areas, monitoring antibodies, different areas. Um, the I can't remember the rest of the question, sorry. Okay, Whether the release, we... release of particles, that's the... Inject the suspension and monitor the dissolution and release of the particles. So I suppose there it's the question of whether you're measuring that inside the cartridge. If so, no, we don't directly measure that. Um, but obviously we have the imaging capability and the um, turbidity sensors as well, giving you a kind of more qualitative outlook on what's happening at the injection site. And then um, we have the rainbow fiber optics measuring in the outer chamber, but Philip might be able to add on to that a little bit. Yeah, if, uh, I mean, any uh, any particles to, to get out of the cartridge, the current cartridge, uh, the uh, membrane pore size is uh, is five microns. So anything that's smaller than that can can technically uh, uh, diffuse out of the, of the cartridge and uh, can potentially be uh, quantified by HPLC, uh, not by the not by the rainbow uh, probe. Yeah, but we don't really have direct experiences with with uh, quantifying particles in the outer chamber. If that was the question. Uh, will any case study for small molecule uh, be discussed? So, in the end, we didn't cover small molecules, um, but. We have actually got an app note that was already released a few years ago on a small molecule sort of excipient study. So we had a similar concept where we had a um, commercial formulation and then we added different excipients and showed the effect they could have based on, um, you know, the viscosity charge, things like that. Um, so we can we can absolutely share that after the event as well. Uh, what is the membrane composition uh, and pore size? So the membrane is a, a polycarbonate material and the pore size is five micron. So it's a slightly larger pore size and there's no molecular weight cutoff. Okay. The porous membrane. Is dialysis to um, in dialysis tubing? What is the molecular weight cut of for in vivo simulation? So I suppose the question there is a little bit difficult to answer in terms of so whether you're looking at the blood or lymphatics, um, because the pore size will or the molecular weight cut off and pore size would be quite drastically different. Um, was the question related to what our membrane is using or uh, the composition? No, oh, sorry. Sorry, I've missed uh, it. Molecular the... weight. No, sorry. What is membrane. the membrane composition and pore size? Yeah, I think, yeah, I think we did that one. Sorry, I'm just looking at the yeah, if the maybe the question uh, related to the uh, 
to the uh, dialysis cassette. I think Connor mentioned that in the presentation. Uh, yes, the for the dialysis, I, dialysis too. And uh, yeah, the goal was... the goal with that membrane was was only to keep the uh, the uh, denosumab inside the and then let all the uh, other uh, excipients or all the excipients to really diffuse into the I think it was solution. A Ten pilodaltin molecular weight class of the five, I remember rightly from it. Um, for yeah, for the dialysis set. Okay, let's uh, try one more question here. Um, where the denosumab runs done with replicates? Uh, yes. So all of them had three replicates except one run, which we actually just ran out of sample for. Um, and that was the no excipient run, I believe, off the top of my yes. head. So I think. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, and I think, and I think in that that case, it's uh. Basically, we, we thought that uh, that that aspect is not necessarily as important because uh, typically some kind of a surfactant or some some other classic excipient is is a uh, is always used. So therefore, the no excipient study may not be that relevant. Therefore, yeah, as Amy said, we run out of sample. We only we have a very limited supply and try to do the assays that uh, that makes the most sense from our perspective. That's actually a question to. Uh, or the answer to one of the questions that I have seen on the injection volume, or yeah, you may answer the 200 microliters, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, I I think that one was, what's the minimum injection volume for the scissor? Oh, yes. Um, which I suppose depends on the accuracy you want to go down to, but with our auto injector, um, with the lowest we personally do quite frequently is about 50 microliters. Also, the other aspect is the is the low limit of quantification in the in the chamber. Yeah, that's uh, you know the minimum volume that we can operate. Like total volume is about uh, is about sixty five milliliter, sixty milliliter, and that you know if you inject a very tiny amount, then quantification might might be a problem. Okay, um, thank you both. I I. See, we've run out of time. We didn't get to all the questions, but again, uh, we will reply to your questions offline as soon as possible. Uh, just a quick reminder, this webinar was recorded. Um, everyone will receive an email with a link to the recording. It will also be posted on our website. Um, I want to thank uh, everyone for joining us today. Thank you, Imi and Belint. And uh, we hope to see you at a future webinar. Thanks, everyone. Have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Have a great day. Bye.